Welcome. This is the 2017 Atlanta's John Marshall Law School Commencement Ceremony. I now call the commencement ceremony to order. And the first item of business is the singing of the national anthem. I invite Mr. Freddie Britt to sing our national anthem. So proudly we hail at the twilight last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallant. Freddie, for that excellent beginning to this ceremony. At this point, it is my pleasure to invite the Reverend Coyle Estes to the podium for the invocation. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, we come to celebrate today and we ask your blessing upon us. We have come to celebrate our graduates who have labored long and hard for this day to come. We come also to celebrate their families and friends who have provided support, resources, and love during these law school years. We are grateful. We come to celebrate John Marshall Law School, its board of trustees, its faculty and staff, its students. This school is preparing new lawyers for the 21st century, and we are grateful for the opportunity. We come together today, O oh God, asking that you hallow our time together, even as we give thanks for many blessings. We pray that the memory of this celebration would sustain our graduates throughout their whole lives and in their years of practice. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. Well, today we gather here to celebrate accomplishments of a fine group of men and women. And the key word here is celebrate. Although there is this ancient or traditional finery that the graduates and my colleagues on the podium wear, this is an event at which we should have fun. There will be ample time for each of you to take pictures of your favorite graduate. And I just want everyone to sit back 
and enjoy this moment, and so it'll be memorable for years to come. So with these young men and women in front of me, through their diligent efforts and hard work, they have reached the threshold of the commencement of their professional careers as attorneys at law. They, however, know it was not a journey made alone. Others were instrumental in each of the graduates' success. At the top of the list are the spouses, significant others, children, parents, other family and friends who joined them in this journey. At this point, I ask the graduates to rise, turn to the audience, and thank their family and friends for the support and support. And they've already proven they're true lawyers. They cut me off before I finish the sentence. <laughs> Another group worthy of recognition is the faculty who guided these graduates to this point. I ask my colleagues sitting behind me to stand and receive a richly deserved thank you from their former students. At this point in the program, it is customary for the dean and faculty to recognize the achievement of those students whose efforts deserve special mention. In doing so, I will ask students to stand at their seats and the audience withhold its applause until the entire group of recipients for any category is named. Some students will be asked to join me on stage to receive an award, and I will so indicate who they are. The first award uh, we have is the National Association of Women Lawyers Outstanding Student Award. And I ask to stand at her seat, Ms. Sadia Ali. The next award is the Georgia Association of Women Lawyers Outstanding Graduate. And again, asking her to stand at her seat, Stacy Marie Burke. I now have a list of students who I will call and ask them to rise as their name is called for the Pro Bono Distinction Award. Sadia Ali, Sh Shannon Bogus, Roshanda Brown, Stacy Burke, Crystal Cleveland, Angelina Davis, Lisanne Edelman, Naya Finn, Janie Hawkins, Doug, Doug Hendry, Hendy, Alexandra Hunt, Scenaria McGarity. Hannah Mitchell, Linda Parks, Marcus Royal, Jacob Taylor, and Jade Valmond. We now have a group of five students who have the excellence in pro bono recognition. And I ask them to stand at their seats. Callie Adams, Devin Horowitz, Rebecca Palmer, Emanuela St. Jean, and Olivia Williams. Congratulations to all of you. Um, at this point, I will switch over to another uh, category, 
and that is Atlanta's John Marshall Law School Award for Excellence in Appellate Advocacy. Again, I will ask the students to stand. Lizanne Edelman. John, John Podesky. Sierra Volrith. And Shanta Williams. We have two recipients of the Judge Harold R. Bank Advocacy Award, and I'll ask them to stand at their seats. The first is Van Armstrong and Sarah Wardlow. Congratulations. The American Bankruptcy Institute Medal of Excellence, Mr. Zane Bradford. Now I will ask students to come on stage to receive special awards. And in the pro bono area, I will name them separately so they could each come on their own. It's the Chief Justice Lee Award Sears Pro Bono Award. And the first recipient is Kevin Fogel. And the other recipient is Zuvan Funches. <laughs> now, I get to award Atlanta's John Marshall Law School Outstanding Graduate Award, as voted by the faculty. There's a recipient for the full-time program, and for the part-time program. For the full-time program to come to the stage to receive her award, Ms. Sadia Ali. <laughs> and the, the recipient for the part-time program, Eric Pravit. And for those of you who are concerned, Mr. Provitt already graduated in December, so he's not wearing a robe. <laughs> so, I used to have this in a notebook so it's easy to follow, but I'm now uh, being moved to uh, going through pages. We come to that point in the program, which is always very special to me. It's the commencement speaker to address the students, the graduates, and the audience. Every commencement exercise has a speaker. Over the years, I have sat both in the audience awaiting my own diploma or that of a family member or a friend, and on stage watching others await their moment of crossing it and being recognized for an accomplishment well end earned. As I reflect on the many graduation addresses I have heard, two things resonate in my mind. First, each speaker had demonstrated an unrelenting dedication to the profession and those it served. Second, each reached a level of excellence that garnered them the respect of their peers. Today's speaker clearly meets those standards. He is a Georgian through and through, a native son of Cherokee County, he attended the University of Georgia for both his undergraduate and law school educations. He graduated summa cum laude and was a first honor graduate for both of his University of Georgia degrees. Since coming to this school, I have learned the importance of someone being a double dog. Today, it seems we're honored to have a double top dog. 
Upon becoming a lawyer, our speaker continued on his path of excellence. Immediately after graduation, he held the prestigious position as the law clerk of a judge of the United States Court of Appeals of the 11th Circuit. After that, his legal career took him first into private practice and then as a public servant, serving as an assistant district attorney in Cobb County, as well as a deputy special attorney general for the state of Georgia. His legal prowess did not go unknown to the governor's office. In 2010, our speaker was appointed to the Court of Appeals of Georgia. Two years later, he was named the Justice of the Supreme Court of Georgia. Everyone, it is with the greatest of pleasure, I welcome to the podium Mr. Justice Keith R. Blackwell. Good afternoon. Dean Morris, trustees, members of the administration and faculty, honored guests and graduates of the class of 2017, it is my pleasure to join you in celebration of your achievement of a law degree. That achievement is a significant one and one in which you rightly should take a great deal of pride. It marks the culmination of an undertaking that has required much of you. The process of becoming learned in the law is a costly one, and not just in terms of the financial expense of a modern legal education. Becoming learned in the law requires a dedication to the undertaking that inevitably demands that one forego other worthwhile pursuits, both productive and leisurely, and it requires that one spend hours in the study of horn books and case books rather than in the company of friends and loved ones. There surely came a time when, as you sat in the library, reading yet another dozen cases about a proper interpretation and application of Article II of the Uniform Commercial Code, <laughs> when you may have entertained some doubt about whether the undertaking was worth the cost. But in the end, I hope you have concluded that it was. Enjoy this day and celebrate your achievement with those who love you most. If you wonder where they are, I think I'll know where they are. When you cross the stage, we'll see a lot of flashing lights coming uh, from wherever they're seated. They're all out there. There are a lot of them. They are proud of you, and so are we. Now, let me, let me say to begin, I will try to be relatively brief. We lawyers know how to talk. We're trained how to talk, and we tend to talk a lot. <laughs> but I will try to be brief for two reasons. First of all, I will extend you the courtesy of trying to be brief if you will promise me that you will consider extending me the favor of being brief should you ever appear in my court for argument. <laughs> in the second place, I know that I am standing between you and the receipt of your diploma and therefore standing between you and a lot of hugs and a lot of photographs from a lot of people who love you and maybe a trip to the beach. <laughs> and so I will try to be brief. Let me note, however, as I said, this day is yours and you should enjoy it. But this day is not yours alone. It belongs as well to your loved ones, your families, and friends who have helped you along the way. No one gets to any meaningful station in life on his own, and you owe much to those who have given you a hand. The ones who taught us early in our lives, who instilled our values, who admire us in our best moments and tolerate us in our worst, who always stand by our side and who love us unconditionally. This is their day too. Keep that in mind. Today, of course, marks the conclusion of law school and for some of you, perhaps, the completion of your legal education. Let me explain what I mean by that. Some of you may have no intention of entering the practice of law and you instead will follow another path, perhaps into the business world, perhaps into the field of journalism, public administration, politics, law enforcement. Whichever path you take, your legal education will, I think, prove exceedingly beneficial to you. Learning to think like a lawyer is essential, of course, for a lawyer, but the manner of thinking you have acquired in the past few years can prove highly useful in other pursuits. Wherever your path leads you from this day, your law degree and the legal education it reflects is something that will, I think, serve you very well. 
Most of you, however, came to law school to become a lawyer. And that remains your intent today. It is to you that I intend to address the balance of my remarks. Now, to begin, I do bear the unhappy duty of reporting to you that for those of you who are intent on becoming lawyers, your legal education does not end today. <laughs> your legal education will continue, and it will continue through the balance of your career as a lawyer. Your degree reflects that you have mastered the most essential principles of law and that you understand legal theory well enough to teach yourself the law that you will need to know in the practice. Especially in the first years of your practice, however, you will need to read and study every bit as much as you did in the past few years during your formal legal education. Even when you have become a quite experienced lawyer, study is still required. Law is the domain of thinkers. There always will be areas of law that you may encounter with which you are not readily familiar. Moreover, not only is the whole body of American law vast, it is also expanding unceasingly. Every year, legislatures adopt new statutes and amend old ones. Administrative agencies adopt, repeal, and amend rules and regulations. And judges like me add to the body of decisional law. My court produces about two volumes worth of additional decisional law every year, and our friends and colleagues on the State Court of Appeals produce far more than that. The problem of keeping up with a vast and expanding body of law is a real one that vexes even the very best and the most experienced of lawyers, a problem that Justice Robert Jackson, uh, in speaking to the American Law Institute in the 1940s, referred to as the proliferation of precedents. In addition to the study of law, there are practical skills you will need to acquire, dealing with clients, managing a law practice, local customs of practice and procedure. As you know, there remains much to learn. As Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes remarked, your education begins when what is called your education is over. But take heart, your successful completion of the first stage of your legal education, which concludes today, bodes very well for your prospects of succeeding in the next stage. All that said, it is my privilege to bid you welcome to a most honorable and essential profession, one that carries tremendous responsibilities. Our profession is one that stands post and has since the beginning of the Republic in defense of the foundational principles of a political and constitutional order that for more than 200 years has over time made this nation the most free and prosperous in the history of human civilizations. Keeping watch over and safeguarding those foundational principles, the rule of law, the notion that the powers of government are limited in nature and scope, the idea that the people are sovereign, that is our first and foremost responsibility as a profession. As Joseph Story put it in an address to the Suffolk Bar in 1821, Lawyers are emphatically placed here as sentinels upon the outposts of the Constitution, and no nobler end can be proposed for their ambition or patriotism than to stand as faithful guardians of the Constitution, ready to defend its legitimate powers and to stay the arm of legislative or executive or popular oppression. To enter our profession, you must be prepared to stand your post in defense of our constitutional order. And you likewise must be prepared to make the sacrifice that may be called for in standing your post. There may come a day when it falls to you to take up an unpopular cause or a client that is detested by the public. Taking up their cause may present great personal risk to your livelihood and your social standing in the community. But you must fulfill your duty nonetheless. That is what American lawyers do and it is what they have done for 200 years. In fairness, I also must disclose to you that the practice of law is not easy. It demands much energy, much thinking, and much time. There are days when the burdens that you carry for your clients will feel crushing, and there are nights when you will not sleep well. But all that said, I have been at the practice of law now for nearly 20 years, and I can happily report that I have not regretted this path for a moment. It has been for me a most fulfilling experience. It offers intellectual stimulation beyond compare. 
It offers unparalleled opportunities to be of service to your nation, to your fellow citizens, and a healer in your communities. And although the legal marketplace is ever-changing, it remains a market in which a hardworking man or woman can make a good living, and one in which a few lawyers may make much more than that. And yes, although there are nights when you will lose sleep, there are far more nights on, on which you will rest soundly in the knowledge that you, that day, made a difference in this world for the better. Our common calling is one in which I have found that the rewards far outweigh the costs, and my hope for you is that you find it equally fulfilling. Now, as you set out in the practice of law, permit me to give you some advice about the first years of your practice. I noted earlier that the first years of practice will require a continued dedication to study on your part. In addition, the first years of practice, you will spend forming habits that will stay with you the rest of your remaining professional years. Be sure those habits are good ones. Be meticulous, be exceedingly careful and cautious, and be thorough in your work. Check and double check your work. Remember that when you work for a client, they have put their livelihood, their legacy, their liberty, and perhaps their lives in your hands. Act accordingly. Be thoughtful and deliberate about your professional development as a young lawyer. For one thing, you're gonna need a mentor. Now, I was blessed throughout my career with a lot of really good mentors over the years, but you will need someone to whom you can look for advice. Now, that may come readily if you enter practice with a law firm or with a government office, but if you enter practice in a very small firm or on your own, you may need to work a little harder. Find a mentor. That's one of the first things you need to do as a young lawyer. The mentorship of a seasoned lawyer is essential to your continuing legal education. Equally important, don't just find a mentor, but take care that it's a mentor whose advice and example is worth following. In addition, as you start out in practice, look for new and perhaps unusual opportunities in which you might grow your legal knowledge and skills. I worry that in the current legal market, Young lawyers are pushed too soon to specialize. They are pushed too soon to focus their practices too narrowly, adopting a specialized practice from the very outset. At some point in your career, it may make a lot of sense to specialize. But especially in the formative years of your law practice, it is beneficial, I think, and I encourage you to get as much experience in as many different areas of the law as you possibly can. If you are unable to go into a general practice, I encourage you to find opportunities to do pro bono work, to volunteer in other areas. It will enrich you. You know, some of the best lawyers I know, some of the best litigators I know in the city of Atlanta, these are some litigators who work for top flight law firms. We call them tall building lawyers sometimes. They are some of the best litigators in the country and in the state. They are some of the folks you would go to if you had a bet the company or bet the farm case. Those lawyers were, were young lawyers once too, and they took what they could find to get experience in the courtroom. I have always been struck by how many of them told me they started out not doing sophisticated and highly complex commercial litigation. They started out doing condemnation work when the MARTA line was put through downtown Atlanta. There were lots of condemnation cases to be tried. They took the opportunity to get in court and try those cases, and they got the kind of experience today that even though they don't do condemnation work today, makes them some of the best litigators in the city, in the state, and in the country. Take the opportunities that you can find. I also want to stress to you the importance of patience early in your practice. Now, some of you may have read John Grisham's The Rainmaker or seen the film with Matt Damon. Great book, great film. It's about a newly minted lawyer who within, oh, a day or two of entering practice finds himself with the case of a lifetime. Well, lest you have any delusions, the rainmaker is fiction. First year lawyers don't commonly get the case of a lifetime. That's the reason it's called the case of a lifetime. Now I know that after years of school and toiling away in the classroom, you are all eager to spread your wings and show your stuff. 
and you'll have the chance, but be patient as you gain experience and competence and as you come to earn the confidence of your colleagues in the bar, the cases will start to come. But for today, take whatever valuable experiences you can and don't worry about trying to make yourself into a great lawyer. Worry about making yourself into a good lawyer. Nobody ever became a great lawyer without being a good lawyer first. Now, speaking of goodness, when you enter the practice, you're almost immediately going to begin to develop a reputation that will follow you the rest of your professional life. Be sure it's a good one. You will make some mistakes along the way. Every lawyer does, even the very best. And that's okay. You will, of course, have to own those mistakes. And when they've done harm to your client or harm to somebody else, you're going to have to make them right. And sometimes, some mistakes can be expensive. But that's what professionals do. But in time, people tend to forgive and sometimes even forget your mistakes. What they do not readily forgive and what they do not easily forget is dishonesty and sharp practices. As Abraham Lincoln once said, resolve to be honest at all events. And if in your judgment you cannot be an honest lawyer, resolve to be honest without being a lawyer. A reputation for dishonesty means, quite frankly, that your legal career is at an end. Take care of your reputation. Also, in the early years of your practice, be sure you maintain balance in your life. You'll be a lawyer to be sure, but you will also be a husband or wife, a son or a daughter, a mother or father, a brother or sister. Make time for the people in your lives who need you and who you need. It will make you not only a better person, it will make you a better lawyer. Now finally, most of you are too early in your professional development to know with certainty which sort of practice will prove most fulfilling to you personally. I myself, when I came out of law school, I had grown up in a small town in North Georgia. My dad was a mechanic in the Air Force. My mom was a history teacher. They were bright people, they were hardworking people, but they weren't, they weren't white collar professional folks. They weren't lawyers. I didn't have any lawyers in the family. I didn't know any lawyers when I was growing up. And really about all I knew about the practice of law was what I'd seen on television. I was ill prepared to make choices to bind me for the rest of my life. Well, the good news is you don't have to make choices now about your career that will bind you for the rest of your life. Go to work, practice hard, work hard, study. Give it a go for a few years. After a few years of practice, you may find that you want to do something different in the law. You may find you want to no longer be a litigator and now be a transactional lawyer. You may find you don't want to do criminal work anymore and want to try your hand at domestic law. You may find another path outside the law altogether. That's fine. There's nothing dishonorable about it. There's no failure in it. Life is too short to spend doing something that makes you miserable. Find your own path. Let me wrap up with a story. Dean Morris noted that I, I clerked when I came out of law school. I had the good fortune to clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit for Judge J.L. Edmondson. That was a terrific experience. Set me on the path that brought me to where I am today. He had another law clerk who worked for Judge Edmondson. Uh, this law clerk took a different path. This law clerk had gone to a very fine law school, was by all accounts a very fine law clerk, and after finishing his clerkship, this law clerk went to work for a very preeminent New York City law firm. He stayed practicing at that law firm for exactly seven months and three days. He was miserable. He walked out the door, he left the practice of law, and he never looked back. He then went on to become a co-founder of PayPal, which he sold to eBay a few years later for $1.5 billion. He became the first outside investor in a little internet startup called Facebook. And he is today one of the world's preeminent 
uh, thinkers and commentators on technology and its implications for society. His name is Peter Thiel. Wherever your path leads you next, I wish you every success, both professionally and personally. Enjoy this day. You have earned it. Good luck, Godspeed, and congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Justice Blackwell, in recognition of your outstanding contributions to the legal profession, demonstrated commitment to the principle that all deserve access to and protection under the legal system, and dedication to Atlanta's John Marshall Law School's core values relating to equal justice for all, it is my honor to award you an Atlanta's John Marshall Law School Honorary Doctor of Laws degree with all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Well, that was a, a, an outstanding speech, and I wish I had heard it in law school, because then I would have quit practice and found PayPal. <laughs> um, uh, so in my shuffling of my papers, I uh, did not follow our uh, script. I'm surprised there aren't two students sitting, uh, two graduates sitting in the group wondering did I pass them by. Um, and I did not. Uh, it is customary for graduates to have a representative from among their ranks to deliver remarks at the commencement exercise, and today is no exception. So, um, the valedictorian from the part-time division, David Hume, will address his colleague. Justice Blackwell, Dean Morris, distinguished faculty, uh, family and friends, guests, good afternoon and welcome to Atlanta's John Marshall Law School graduation class of 2017 ceremony. So graduates, we have done it, yes. It's not quite over yet, but we're getting there, we're close. Um, as a part-time program, representative of a part-time program, I just want to ex explain real quickly to the family that's here, we're, we're a bit different. Um, part-time students are just a little bit older than the regular law student. Some of us, some of us are a lot older. Um, we're supposed to be more mature. And, uh, but we do have uh, jobs and um, significant others and uh, families and children and stuff. And like Dean Morris said in his opening remarks, uh, Thank you very much to all of you that have sacrificed and supported us uh, throughout the year. So another round of applause to all of our family and loved ones. Thank you. And a special thanks to my wife, Star, and kids, Braxton and Blair. Uh, they're great kids, and I, I couldn't have done it without them. So law school is hard. It's hard. And uh, you, know, you should be proud that you're here today because uh, it's a lot of work. Um, they say we start law school with our heads full of mush, and then by the time we leave, um, we're supposed to think like lawyers. Th that's a quote from some movie. You guys have probably seen The Paper Chase. Um, but law school uses the Socratic method of learning, and that's where you stand up and through a series of questions and answers, uh, you demonstrate your knowledge uh, of the law, or in my case, lack thereof. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a daunting experience, but being in the part-time program, we're, we've, we've had lives, uh, we've had life experiences, we've got this, and so uh, our very first uh, law school class was torts, and uh, I didn't even know what a tort was, I thought it was like a German cake or something. Um, so our very first class was torts, and we were supposed to read an article uh, about rehabilitation, retribution, uh, deterrence, and utilitarianism. So I'm thinking, I've got this, you know, I've flown jets in the Air Force, I've been in combat, I got this, this is, this is it. 
you know, and everybody around me is thinking, okay, we, we got this, you know, we've been there. So uh, who does Professor Tripp call on? None, none other than David Hume. Mr. Hume. Yes, Professor. Uh, tell us about uh, rehabilitation and retribution and deterrence. Da, 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 da. Mr. Hume, you did read the article, right? Da, 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 da. Mr. Hume, uh, did you uh, take notes on the article? Da, da, da. Let me see your notes. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Class, this is an example of how not to prepare for law school. Okay? <laughs> a few highlights and a few scribbles in the column, in the margins, is not going to cut it. So, two nights later in Professor Vendetta's contracts class. <laughs> You know, uh, the confident part-timers are now looking down, trying not to make eye contact, you know, typing on the computers, reading some law, writing something, you know, don't call on me, please don't call on me. But uh, Professor Vendetta already had hatched his plan and he had um, someone already designated, Mr. Davenport. Mr. Davenport, would you please stand up and recite, please? <laughs> and we were all like, thank you, thank you, it's not me. So, uh, David Davenport. <laughs> Yeah? That's right. That's right. So, uh, Mr. Davenport, thanks for taking one for the team, and we all appreciate it. But the good news was he was done for the semester, and he got it over with up front. So, uh, law school is tough, but you've demonstrated that you have what it takes to get it done by being here today. So, congratulations again. We've got one more little bitty test to take, and I know, and again, uh, you have demonstrated that you've got what it takes to pass that test. Uh, my problem is uh, passing the bar. I've have a, I have a problem passing the bar. I usually go in. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to pass this one, and I know you all are too. So good luck. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Hume. I, I think it's uh, understandable why he was the valedictorian. So. Uh, and now for the uh, valedictorian from the full-time program, uh, whoop. Uh, I don't want to mispronounce the name because I know there are three of them in there. Tyler Ryan Watkins. Mr. Watkins. Everyone hear me? Okay. So when I found out that I was valedictorian and therefore would be called upon to give a speech at graduation, my initial thought was, wow, I, I can't believe it. I get to write one last paper before graduation. <laughs> but, but then I actually realized that the opportunity this provided me, and that was that this speech was the last chance I would get without being in court to force my classmates to hear me stand up and talk. So, now I've never had the opportunity to actually give a valedictorian speech before, um, so I approached it like I've handled all my papers in law school, and that was I did my research, got some good practical sources, and then proceeded to wait till the day before the deadline to write the whole thing. <laughs> and what I found out from looking at many different speeches was that there are three things that really apparently make up a valedictorian speech, based on the ones that I saw. One, give practical life advice that I've made up. <laughs> two, two, thank everyone in the audience, including the people I don't know. And number three, reminisce about how everyone has changed in law school. So number one, give practical advice. I don't know why having a high GPA qualifies me to give life advice. But, being valedictorian, it would seem to indicate that I didn't have very much of one. So, the, <laughs> some practical advice for the audience that myself and our classmates uh, learned in our final year of law school is, as it turns out, you don't spend your entire life struggling to become a morally and ethically fit individual. 
you buy it from the State Bar of Georgia for about $400. So, so, and a $10 processing fee, that's right. So number two, thank everyone in the audience. Everyone in the audience, including the people I don't know. Thank you. So number three, reminisce about how we've changed in law school. Now, I, like most of our classmates, have been told for the last three years to keep your eyes forward on the prize that was graduation and then really the bar exam. And the problem with keeping your eyes forward for so long is that you don't actually realize how you're changing until you stop to actually think about it. For instance, how I found out was that after being in law school for a few years, I realized my conversations started going differently. <laughs> for example, my cousin was recently married last year, and before law school, that conversation would have gone something like, congratulations, when's the date? Are you considering an open bar? <laughs> but I'd been in law school for about two years, so instead, it kind of went like, Congratulations, are you signing a prenup? <laughs> there had better be an open bar. <laughs> However, the important thing is that the study of law actually gives people the opportunity to change. And it happens whether you realize it or not, whether it's how you think, what you believe, or how you behave, subtle or not so subtle. There is no profession that affects people's lives more directly than the law. And law school proves that that is, applies not only to our clients, but also to the students and the practitioners that delve into it every day. Now, three years ago, we took an opportunity that has changed us different from who we were at the beginning. And no doubt, in the future, our study of the law is going to continue to change us. That being said, Based on my experiences the last three years, what I've learned, people I've met, I don't think that there's a more wonderful opportunity than that. So congratulations, let's go graduate, please. <laughs>
Oh, I'm sorry. All right, you didn't miss much, I promise. We will now award the degrees, and I'll invite the chairman of the board of directors of the law school, Mr. Richard Herzog, to join me at the podium. Mr. Chairman Herzog, I have the honor of presenting the candidates for the Master of Laws degree. They satisfactorily have completed the course of study prescribed for them by the faculty and have successfully passed their exams. On behalf of the faculty, I request that you confer the degree upon each of them. Thank you, Dean Morris. Dean Morris, upon your recommendation by the authority vested in me by the Board of Directors of Atlanta's John Marshall Law School, it is my privilege to confer upon these individuals the Master of Laws degree with all rights, duties, and privileges pertaining thereto. Associate Dean Harrison Mercer will now call the names of our JD degree recipients, and they will as well be hooded by Associate Deans Gatewood and Jeffries. Kevin O'Neill Fogel. Savan Funches. Sadia Ali. David B. Hume. Tyler Watkins. <laughs> Ali Naki Abadi. <laughs> Callie Christine Adams. Elizabeth Mespin Afwork. <laughs> Ashley Bianca Aguebor. <laughs> Timothy Matthew Aldridge. Natalia Arbelas. Van Christopher Armstrong. Cretina Baker Hines. Ryan Michelle Gaston Barnes. Jamal Bethune. Kevin Billups the second. Kamisha Benz. <laughs> Michelle Lynn Block. <laughs> 
Eric Tonero Bogan, Jr. Shanna Corinne Bogues. Zachary Bowman. Zane Scott Bradford. Fallon Brink. Terry Lynn Brock. Oriel Brooks. Roshonda Brown. Stacy Marie Burke, Lachey Carter, Heidi Chin. Komal Ramakrishna Chaube. <laughs> Candice Christie. <laughs> Crystal Antonia Cleveland. William Justin Collins. Daquita Cooper. David Wayne Davenport, Jr. Angelina Papa Nicholas Davis. Lawrence Diamond the Second. Catherine Blaska Dodd. Angela Denise DeWilliams. Lasan Ava Edelman. <laughs> Kenneth Paul Ellison. Samantha Linnell Embry. Juanisha J. Everett. Kaia Finn. Olivia Fisher. Taylor Boyd Foster.
Timothy Isaac Gandy. William Ty Gang. Bianca Consuela Gary. Courtney Gillum. Evan Glanville. Teresa Renee Golke. George Graves III. Perry B. Green II. Shannon Nicole Guest. Crystal Ginyard. William Hagen. Jarita Rollins Hall. Janie Jerlisa McNeil Hawkins. <laughs> Lydia Danielle Hawkins. Devin R. Horowitz. David Howell. Alexandra Marie Hunt. Antoinette Igbenoba. Kyle Jakes. <laughs> Chloe Douglas James. <laughs> Kyle Johansson. Darius Tremaine Johnson. Kendrick N. Johnson. Charles Jacob Jones. Elizabeth Ann Jones. David Jordan. Natalie Kanani.
Erica Danielle Kegler. Jean Kim. Zimbe Chimbugwe. Stephanie Kozel. the fourth. <laughs> Christian Forrest Lewis. <laughs> Jocelyn Lewis. Perej Maharaj. <laughs> Tori Martin. <laughs> Gervais Kadeen McConico. Crystal Hattie Montrose McCullough. Scenaria Kamisha McGarity. Trenton McNeil. Taylor Elise Middleton. <laughs> Hannah Barnes Mitchell. <laughs> Tasha Lachey Nicole Mitchell. Tara Mersko. Shahid Ahmad Nasir. Nam Win. Melanie Walker Niblet. Courtney Purdue Nichols. Irogama Omiri. Ibidapo S. Onabanjo. Victor Ortiz. Owusu Banahini Akosua Owusua. John Podeski. Rebecca Manda Lee Palmer. Simone Palmer.
Linda L. Parks. William Chance Perry. Christina Perry. Sharon Phillips. Larry Jerome Pinkston Marshall, Jr. Adebala Popoala. Afshan Jamil Raif. Liliana Ramirez. Joshua Register. Renee Roberts. Kimberly Rojic. Kevin William Roper. Marcus Royal. Irlanda Ruiz. Emanuela St. Jean. Haley Elizabeth Settles. <laughs> Megan Lee Shook. Savender Sodi. <laughs> Katrina Lynn Spearman. Ernest J. Stedge. So sweaty. <laughs> Keon J. Steele. <laughs> Jacob Coy Taylor. Alexander Thomas. Alicia Frederica Thompson. Dustin Townsend.
Jade Valine Valmon. Sarah Wardlow. Tracy Nicole Watson. Olivia Harris Williams. Shantae Lachey Williams. Michael Christopher Winter. We now have one uh, little piece of business for the graduates, and I will again call Mr. Richard Herzog, Chairman of the Board of Directors of Atlanta's John Marshall Law School, to the podium to confer the Juris Doctor degree. Mr. Chairman, I have the honor of presenting the candidates for the Juris Doctor degree. They satisfactorily have completed the course of study pre prescribed by them for the faculty and have successfully passed their examinations. On behalf of the faculty, I request that you confer the degree upon each of them. Thank you, Dean Morris. Upon your recommendation by the authority vested in me by the Board of Directors of Atlanta's John Marshall Law School, it is my privilege to confer upon these individuals the Juris Doctor degree with all rights, duties, and privileges pertaining thereto. Congratulations. Well, graduates, welcome to the, to the degree holders, and I hope soon I'll be welcoming you to the profession. I think at this point, perhaps the graduates might stand and thank their supporters over the years for having reached this point. point, I ask the Reverend Coyle Estes to come and deliver our benediction. This benediction is for the graduates, and the rest of you can eavesdrop on it. So I invite the graduates to stand. Go out into God's world knowing that you do not go alone. Serve your clients well. Do not forget your family. 
Give to your community. Be ethical in the practice of your profession. Be supportive of your colleagues in the law. And may God go with you, and may you rely upon God's leading in this and every day. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Reverend. This brings us to the end of our commencement ceremony, and I hereby declare it closed. I, on a personal note, uh, have a chance, not as dean, but just as a member of the profession, to welcome all of you to what I hope will be wonderful, successful careers, and I wish for each of you the joy and happiness in your career that I had in mine. And at this point, when we depart, I ask all the guests to remain seated until the entire group of graduates has left the hall and then meet us for uh, a reception outside of the hall. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.